What we've got going on today is painting, expressive painting in Photoshop. And what I'd like to start off with is a few samples, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're going to be working on. But actually, before we do that, let's do a little bit of uh, housekeeping as well, because um, if I don't give you all some presets, um, you're going to feel um, a little gypped. Because to speed things up, since we only have a little bit over an hour, if I uh, didn't give you brushes and textures and actions and all sorts of things, then it would be really tough to do anything within an hour. But I do. So what you're going to do is, first off, let's actually start off, go back to this page right here, and give you some URLs. Some of you, <coughs> some were just mentioned. Um, that my Twitter and Instagram handle is a Jack Wow Davis. My Facebook fan page is Jack Davis Wow. Okay, just to keep things confusing. And uh, um, there, if you like that page, you'll be able to download all the presets that we're going to use today. So that is brushes, patterns, textures, actions, firstborn male child, everything that I can possibly give to you, you can have right there. So uh, again, facebook.com slash Jack Davis. Wow, and like that. And yeah. I just want to notate for people that when you do go to that page, there's like a star icon and up at the top, and that's where it says you can download the presets. So right. cool. Thank so you. So that will be right here, and that's what yes. you were talking about right here. So you've got a like and the star Jack's free presets is just for you all. Please do not retweet or resend or rename and resell on eBay or anything else. This is just for you guys, just for being here in the class. Please don't pass this along without uh, being part of it. Of course, if you buy the class, you also get all the follow-along files and the presets as well. So that's the nice thing about that particular one. Um, back to this. Um, I do have a website, wowcreativearts.com, where I sell things like my Lightroom title. That's tomorrow's all-day class, so we'll start off. We'll actually do a little bit of Adobe Camera Raw to start off our day to tease you into tomorrow's class. And at the very bottom, I do do one event myself every year, and that's called Creative Photography for the Soul over in Hawaii, done with a couple of National Geographic photographers. So that URL right there, tiny URL, CP4TS2013, will give you um, that access to that personal invitation to that event. OK, so with that out of the way, the presets are what you're going to want. When you um, download that, that's a zipped folder, you are going to find all these in here. Again, my action sampler, brushes, mixer brushes, uh, pattern stamp brushes, art history brushes, a PDF that's going to go over the basics of using the pattern stamp and art history, because again, the steps, it will be very helpful for you to have that as a resource. Also, a repeating canvas texture, which is useful, and you'll see why later on. The neat thing about all of these, once you download and unzip that folder, you can simply select all of them, either on the desktop or, in this case, I'm within Bridge, do a Command or Control O, and it will automatically launch all of those presets and they'll be loaded in Photoshop. So that's what you need, just a Command or Control O. You can also put them into the presets folder within Photoshop, and that will also uh, give them to you. OK, so that is how you're going to get the toys for today. The samples, back to some samples that I mentioned before, of what you're going to be able to do. Um, first off, actually, before we show some samples, why would you paint in Photoshop? And why would you do digital painting as opposed to traditional painting? And the main concept, and why I'm excited about painting, digital painting in general, is it allows you to extend the story of your images. And you probably already have great, beautiful photographs, so it's not about doing photorealistic um, painting or illustration. If you want to do photorealistic painting, talk with Bert. Okay, Bert Monroy, the sadistic, masochistic, world's most fantastic digital photographic uh, realistic painter is phenomenal. What I'm going to be doing here is doing an interpretation of the photographs. And that really is the reason for doing it. Either one, because your source image wasn't great enough to begin with, it had a great story, but the execution of the photograph wasn't quite there. Or um, two, it is a beautiful photograph, but you want to do an interpretation of it. And that actually can make it more powerful, especially right now where there's so much competition in the photographic market and the portrait photography market. Being able to set your stuff aside um, or apart from other people by doing something like an interpretive portrait of somebody 
can just extend what your studio can do. So that's really what we're going to be doing. In the hour that we have, I'm going to start off with some real simple stuff that you can do to do a painting. We're going to start off in Adobe Camera Raw, which uses the same engine as Lightroom. So my first painting is actually going to be a hand tinting effect. You can do it either in Adobe Camera Raw or in Lightroom. Um, then I'm going to do a filter effect. And that filter is going to be done in the new Photoshop. Photoshop CS6 has a new oil paint filter, which is really cool and groovy. Uh, I'm giving you an action that will automate that process. So that'll be another way to quickly and easily do that. I'm also giving you an action that does a little sketching effect. So you can do a quick little hand sketch, a pencil sketch, or a charcoal uh, pastel sketch of a photograph. And again, use that to uh, extend what your um, studio offers in terms of portraiture. And last, we're going to go into some hand painting. And that's the, actually would take much longer. Hopefully, we'll be coming back up here to Creative Live, and I'll do something like a three-day workshop on painting. And that's really where we're going to get into the expressive painting, which happens to be this right here. Here's an example, a photograph taken by a uh, renowned portrait photographer, Sandy Foster. And this is the painting done from that. This is using the mixer brush technology. But what's exciting is just how far you can um, take uh, your um, imagery in terms of how uh, Photoshop can actually imitate uh, kind of a natural media paint strokes and the interaction of brush strokes with things like, in this case, canvas. So this is done completely in Photoshop, and that actually brings up another question. There's another program that does painting uh, on the computer, and that's Painter. Been around for a million years, phenomenal program. Um, actually has much greater painting capabilities than Photoshop. The thing is that almost all of us own Photoshop, and that's why we're spending time there. And if you understand the tools in there, actually what you can do is fantastic. So that's why we're doing it here. But if you're a painter, uh, artist, then that is actually has going to have more capabilities on it than uh, Photoshop. These are other little sketches done in Photoshop. This is using the pattern stamp tool. Uh, again, we'll be teaching you the secret Mickey Mouse Club handshake that allows you to actually use the pattern stamp tool to do something useful. If you stumble upon it right out of the can in Photoshop, if you've ever touched the pattern stamp tool, you'll know that it's only used for tie, dye, and bubbles. The only two patterns that ship with Photoshop are absolutely useless and you'll never figure out how to do um, anything worthwhile in it. We've got some sketches. These are some more uh, paintings done using the mixer brush. And uh, so these are just some of the things, some more portraiture. I actually have some very nice stuff that I can't show because of, just did a uh, commissioned portrait for Princess Diana um, for the Queen Mary down in Los Angeles. Um, but um, because Creative Live is very cautious with their copyrights, some things I can't, can't share with you. This is another Sandy Foster uh, portrait. This is a sketch using this action that I'm going to be sharing with you all. That's part of what you'll find at that Facebook page of Jack Davis Wow. And uh, with a little hand augmenting to it. And here's a color version of that. OK, and watercolors, this is the pattern stamp. You get the idea. Based upon the time that we have, let's get into what we're going to be doing. OK. So as I mentioned, um, what I'd like to start off with is a um, hand painting technique in Adobe Camera Raw, which is exactly the same as Lightroom. Whatever I'm going to be doing right now can be done in either program. I'm going to start off with these, a real black and white photograph of the world's most beautiful mother. Yes, that's my mom. And uh, a, a great shot by Brooke Crystal, uh, a bride that we're going to turn from a um, color photograph into a hand tinting. In the bridge, I'm selecting the two images. I'm going to come up here into our uh, little iris icon. You can do a Commander Control R would also open that up. Bring these into Adobe Camera Raw, which of course ships with Photoshop. It's actually built into the bridge. The panels over here on the right hand side that you're probably familiar with are exactly the same as the develop module in Lightroom. So again, if you're a Lightroom user, how many of you are Lightroom? Versus, OK, you're all Lightroom. So you're going to be doing this in Lightroom. We'll start off here because um, everybody is going to have Photoshop that, for this class. So we'll do that. And we're getting a wonderful little z instant zooming that's going in, for, in and out. So we'll see how that continues. What we're going to do for this technique, and we'll start off with this black and white image, is we're going to come over here to the adjustment brush. OK, 
okay, which normally you think of as your dodging and burning tool, but it actually has a fantastical feature down here at the um, very bottom called color. And let's see if we can do our little uh, zooming in and out. Okay, so that is our little color portion of the adjustment brush over here in Adobe Camera Raw or the develop module within um, Lightroom. And this little swatch right here is what we're going to do to add little transparent color tinting. Basically what we're going to be doing is imitating a traditional, say, turn of the century hand tinting of a traditional black and white image, which was uh, normally done with um, very few colors, very quickly, very soft edges. Definitely not trying to imitate a real color photograph, just add a little bit of flavor to a traditional image. This color swatch right here is going to do exactly that. It takes whatever tones you have in a photograph and adds a color tint on top of it. It's not opaque, it's transparent, it's much like a dye, it's beautiful. Um, I'd say this is much better than any hand tinting you can do in Photoshop. What we're going to do over here is you simply come over here and click on the little plus icon and it turns it on. In the case of Adobe Camera Raw, it uh, also um, resets all the rest of the parameters in uh, the options for the adjustment brush. If you're in Lightroom, double clicking in the upper left hand corner on the uh, title of any adjustment resets all those parameters. So that's a good habit to get into is to reset your parameters before you start. In this case, the only thing we're going to start off with is a little hand tint. When you click on the color swatch, it's going to bring up your color picker. Um, you can come up here and choose, like I said, this is, allows you to actually save off five different swatches and that's probably what I would do. I would recommend that you don't need any more than five colors. So I'll start off with a little flesh tone. You have only hue and saturation at your disposal. There's no luminosity to it. It's using the luminosity based upon the original photograph. So you're just going to come up here and I'm just going to choose a little bit more of a flesh tone and I'll say OK. The other parameters you have at your disposal, size, feather, flow, and density, the brush. Uh, these are the exact same uh, parameters, these above here, as the graduated filter in Adobe Camera Raw and in Lightroom. It's just obviously they're adding the brush capabilities. I like working with a big, soft, uh, subtle brush. The size of the brush, if we come over here, you can use a keyboard shortcut. Uh, the um, command option, uh, left and right bracket, changes the size of the brush. On the fly, you can obviously use your um, slider here. And what we're going to do here is um, start off with the skin tone. And the thing that I would recommend is always, whenever you're painting a mask in either Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom, is view the mask. Um, it's just painting just like you would a, a mask in Photoshop. There's a keyboard shortcut for that. If you're tapping the Y key, the Y key, as you can see over here, over here where it says Show Mask, that's going to allow you to hide and show the mask as you paint it. It's the O key in Lightroom. Just tap the O, it's not Command O or Control O, it's just O. Okay, so I'm going to tap the Y key in Adobe Camera Raw and that's going to turn on that option. We'll use our square bracket keys to change the size of the brush. Swi uh, shift square bracket changes the hardness of the brush. So those you have all the parameters at your disposal. I'm also using the Wacom tablet as you can see here, the new Intuos 4, and it has a little pop-up display so you can also see what you're working on. In this case, I'm going to come over here and um, start painting. I'm going to make sure that everything is set. The mask, you can change the color of the mask. I'm going to make it to a nice obnoxious green so I can see it. Um, if you tap um, Shift-O in Lightroom, you can cycle through a few different colors to make sure that you can see what you're working on. Okay. So I'm going to come over here and you can see that now I'm painting. So I'm just going to go really quick. I'm going to turn off actually auto mask. Let's turn that off. Like I said, I like using a big soft subtle brush. And that's it. That is the skin tone. That's about as quick and as ugly as you can get. You'll notice I went over the eyes and the teeth. I don't want to do that. So I'm actually going to shift over to the eraser. If you hold down the Option key on the Mac or the Alt key on the PC, it automatically switches the brush over to the eraser option. You can see it's automatically set to the eraser over here. And now I can come up here and just erase um, portions that I do not want colored. 
Let's take that feather up for the eraser as well. I'm going to do that for the eyes, and we'll do that for the lips. So that really is all that I'm going to do. If I want, I can clean it up a little bit around the hair or other things, but I don't actually mind that spill, and that overlapping of colors actually is going to make it um, even more realistic. I'm going to tap the Y key. That's going to hide that mask, and here's our introduction to our little color tinting. Okay, so we've started with a color tint. I'm going to come up back over here to the brush. We'll add another color, so I'm just going to say New. Come down here and choose a different one. Let's go over here and we'll choose something like a light blue for our um, shirt. And I'm actually going to do it for the hair. You may know that since there is no color in, a, in, a, um, in here, we could do brown. But actually, to make it look like a jet black hair, oftentimes um, a little uh, light blue will actually be nice. So I'm going to come over here. In this case, I'm going to not turn on that mask so you can just see if you really are trying to be fast. You can just do that. So now I've done the skin and the blouse. Great, I'll come over here again and hit New. Back down, choose one more color. Let's do a little green. Okay, for our background, you can see how fast this can go. Take the size up. Here's our green background. That's done. Okay, and we'll come up here. And you can see, again, I, if you can't color it, Within about 60 seconds, you're spending too much time. It's going to end up like you're trying to imitate a traditional color photograph, and that's not what we're going for. We're looking for that hand tinting. I'm going to do one more new. We're going to come over here, and we're going to set a little red for um, a little lipstick and a little rouge. For that, I'm going to zoom in the uh, space bar and the command or control key, command key on the Mac or control key on the PC is going to give us a little bit here. I'm going to come up, make the size of the brush a little bit bigger. And I'd mentioned that this uh, flow and density is something you have at your disposal. You can take the density down. If I want to do a little kind of subtlety to the cheeks, you'll notice there I just added a little bit of a cheek blush to it. You can make that a little bit more if you want. And I'll take it back up to 100% with a smaller brush. And I'll come up here and do the lips, okay, a little lipstick. Okay. Now you'll notice that every time I've done this, as you're probably already familiar with, um, Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw drops these pins to show you what you've been creating, much like a adjustment layer. The closest thing you can get to an adjustment layer are these little pins. And each one, in this case, this is representing the red. Um, if I come over here, this is the skin tone. You can see the color changes over here. I can see that I want to change my, uh, I want to do a little bit more around the eyes, where I erased a little bit too much. Maybe I missed a little bit down here on the um, skin tone on the neck. And maybe up here I erased a little bit too much. So again, you can go back to any pin to fine tune it simply by clicking on it and then fine tuning whatever mask you did. The reason why I like this, and you can hide and show those pins, you can see this down here. You also have a keyboard shortcut in Adobe Camera Raw. It is the um, V key, hides and shows those pins. In Lightroom, it's the H key. Okay, so slightly different um, shortcuts. But the reason why I like the, um, doing my hand tinting in um, Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom is that you not only have this color swatch at your disposal, but you obviously have all these other parameters as well, from exposure, white, uh, shadow, highlight, clarity, everything is at your disposal. So if I come over here to that background as an example, which is our little green swatch, I can come over here and I can take that exposure, the mid-tones down. I could take clarity down. That's going to give me a little diffuse glow, kind of like a little romantic uh, film noir, you know, ghosting to my background. I could take it up and uh, harden that edge. So you have all of these different parameters, color, tone, exposure, in every single pin. So what would in Photoshop, you'd have to be doing different adjustment layers. In Lightroom and ACR, you have it uh, all in one point. Okay? And again, we'll hide those pins by tapping the V key. So here is our before, after, before, after. Make sense? Nod your head enthusiastically? Yes. Yes, good. Awesome. Over here, I'm just going to go ahead. I've got this. I've actually got um, some snapshots saved. So this is, again, a Brooke Crystal shot, renowned wedding photographer. 
And uh, some stages here. So this is the original shot here that was uh, pre-cropped. Here's a little uh, kind of antiquing uh, on it here. I think my last one that I ended up with is um, this one here. So again, we go back to the adjustment brush and tap on our V key. You can see the little points here. So here's our little red adjustment for the lips and rouge, our background, our uh, blue for the hair and the blouse, and you get that same idea. So here again is the um, painting okay, before and after. Okay, so that's hand tinting, Adobe Camera Raw. That's our first painting technique, and that is quick and easy. The next one that I want to share with you is we're also going to start over in um, Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom. And for that, we're going to use uh, ACR as a starting point to go into Photoshop. And for that, we're going to, again, do our Command or Control R. And what we're going to do is we're going to set up a painting for this new oil paint filter in Photoshop CS6. And for that, I've got a, the world's most wonderful daughter here. And uh, we're going to start off with a special effect. In this case, I'm going to um, start off with a, a little uh, effect, uh, what I call a selective hand tinting. So as before, we started off with a black and white image, we hand tinted in. This is a quick cheating way to do another little special effect, kind of a painting effect. And for here, we're coming into the HSL grayscale version of Adobe Camera Raw, same as in Lightroom in their, their develop module. And we're going to go over to the saturation um, little panel right here, portion of it. And I'm going to take out the oranges and the reds, leaving behind, in other words, I'm taking out all the skin tone, and I've just done a little instantaneous hand tinting effect in Lightroom or ACR by simply removing a portion of the color range, leaving behind, obviously, the magentas, the greens, and things like that. So that one little option of going to saturation and removing all or some of the colors are going to allow you to come in here and do this little effect. Okay? Later on, tomorrow, when we get into the class on Lightroom, we'll be adding other things like this. where You can come up here. We're actually going to lighten the skin tone. This HSL panel in Lightroom and ACR is mind-bendingly powerful. So a lot of things that you can do with it. In this case, we'll do this right here. So this is our special effect, just simply coming over here to the HSL panel. This is the preparation that we're going to use to bring into Photoshop in just a second. I've got another still life here. I'm going to use this one as well. This is a shot I'd normally use for teaching um, HDR photography. I've got a snapshot in here. This is the original. And this is our tweaked shot. So this is the exact same um, shot before and after using um, what I call my five-step tango for optimizing your images. And again, it's more mind-bendingly cool than should be allowed by law, and that's because of the new uh, Lightroom built into the new Photoshop, what you can do to extend the dynamic range. So I've got my two photographs. These we're going to do paintings on real quick. I'm going to select the two images over here on the left-hand side. I could do, if I was in Lightroom, I would select down in the film strip at the bottom. And what I'm going to do here is you'll notice down here at the bottom, okay, there's a little icon here that says Open Images. Let's see if I can go ahead and uh, zoom up here so we can take a look at it. It can say either open objects or open image. Okay? As a default, it says open images, which would mean it would bring it into Photoshop as a flattened, dumb, quote unquote, rasterized file. If I hold down the shift key, I can have it open up as an object, okay? as a smart object. And that means that everything that you're looking at now, either in um, Adobe Camera Raw or in Lightroom, will come into Photoshop intact. Meaning you can always get back to that raw information and you can change those sliders which is extremely cool. Smart objects are extremely cool. If we were in Lightroom, what you'd do is you can hold down a right click on an image down in the film strip, and it'll say edit in, edit in Photoshop as smart objects. So that's how you'd reach it in Lightroom. Right click down in the film strip, edit in Photoshop as smart objects down at the bottom. Okay? So I'm simply, I've got two images selected here. I'm going to say open objects. Actually, actually let's do a little um, just to show you, you can change that. If you go down here to your workflow options and at ACR, you can have it as a default open up as smart objects. So I've, I've set mine up as, um, as that. OK? 
Okay, so I'm going to say open objects. And you're going to notice this icon over here is telling me that this is a smart object. Okay, it is different than other layers in Photoshop. It is intelligent. One of the nicest things about it is you can apply filters to smart objects and they are non-destructive, meaning you can change that at any time. In this case, I've come up with a recipe, what I call a smart filter recipe, of all sorts of different filters that applied in a certain order give you a really cool, groovy, as I call it, bitchin' result. And so we're going to go for a bitchin' result. The easiest way to do this, since I've given you a bunch of actions, is to run one of my actions. And again, for time, I'm going to just run that action. So I'm going to go over to the actions palette. And if you remember, I started off by um, loading in those actions. Remember I did a command or control O? That gave me this right here. Okay, so it gave me, not these, I'm sure these are useless. <coughs> but these right here, <laughs> Davis Painting Action Sampler is what I'm giving you all here for um, being with us all today. You've got all sorts of things. That sketch one that I showed you some samples of before in here. You have painting enhancement. We'll get to some of these. But this one right here, Wow Smart Object Painting. You just simply click on that. Go down to the bottom of the um, Actions palette. You're going to find your little run icon way down here. Okay, your little you know, VCR play button. And let's zoom back out again. And run that. And what this is going to give you, and again, this is uh, presupposing that your image is already a smart object. If you try and run this on, uh, the filter gallery is not currently available. What has he done? Yeah, filter gallery. Ah, I know what's going on. It also presupposes that as a default setting that a, a lot of the filters in Photoshop only run what's known as 8-bit per channel mode. Okay? So the specific ones I'm using only work in 8-bit per channel mode. So by converting this image over to 8-bit, and then let's do this over here. Ben, I take it back. It had nothing to do with you. <laughs> Okay, it was the workflow options over there. You'll notice what down at the bottom where we turned on those smart objects, it was set up as a default for 16-bit per channel. So I totally understand that. So anyway, back to our original image, back to our actions, back to the smart object painting, back to the play button. And this is what we're going to get. Now working perfectly. And what you're going to see here as we zoom in, Okay, is now it has gone from here, our original photograph, to here, okay, including okay, all our little brush strokes, our little canvas, the skipping of the brush strokes over it, the hair, okay, and that is what we call bitchin', okay, or wow. <laughs> if you want to call it wow, it's fine. And this is what it did. It, the, the action ran these filters in this order, and that's what I'm going to go through now. Since all of you out in the audience are going to have access to this action, you can just run it on your own um, files and you're going to get everything so you can kind of uh, dissect it after the fact. But I'll just go through it quickly here um, just to show you what it is. And I'll actually just explain it to you. And this will... Okay. So what the um, action did is it ran these filters in this order. And so for your notes, <coughs> we start off with the median filter. The median filter is kind of like a smart blur. It keeps edges razor sharp, but simplifies detail. Whenever you're doing a painting, it's good to, the first step that you're going to do for any painting, in this case an automated painting, is simplify the subject matter. Right? There's no reason to have all the little details and the pimples and you know, every other thing. You want to simplify it because a person in reality would never paint those sorts of things, especially if they were going for an impressionistic kind of painting. So the median filter does that. If you double click on any of these um, little items here in the um, layers palette, we'll actually come up here and bring up 
the filter settings. So here you'll notice that it's the median filter and you can see how it's simplifying and yet keeping edges still razor sharp. And I'm doing it at a radius of three. You can fine tune this for anything that you'd want after the fact. Also, you'll notice here on the right hand side, anytime you've run a filter on a smart object, you have this little icon right here and that lets you change the opacity and blend mode for anything, just as if you'd run this filter on a separate layer. So basically what um, smart filters allow you to do is bypass the process of duplicating and duplicating and duplicating and duplicating a layer, running filters on it, and then restacking it using blend modes. You can change blend modes or opacity just like you can on a layer, but in this case, it's built into each one of the applications of smart filters in the layers palette. Okay, the next one is this oil paint filter, and I'll just bring this up to show you the parameters on here. And basically, this is what's allowing us to get our um, little brush strokes in here. A little excessive zoom right there. <laughs> Didn't quite need that much. Okay. So it is doing our little um, brush strokes here. And you can see I've basically maxed out the parameters of cleanliness, scale, and brush detail. Stylization is the one parameter that you can change how exaggerated that you want it in terms of the length of these strokes, so to speak. But I'm going to max it out in terms of the brush detail. The one thing you have to be careful of when using this filter is this right here, shine, okay? And this also, when you do that stylization, you're gonna see what stylization is doing in terms of um, what it's doing to the brush strokes. And shine, even though it's well-intentioned, is this, it's an emboss. It's adding a specular highlight to each one of the brush strokes to, to raise the surface, which is a great idea, but you oftentimes would not want this impasto effect on everything, certainly in areas of flat tone. So I, as you'll notice in the action, it has it down almost to nothing, okay? I do want a little embossing going on, but I don't want it to the subtleties. I want it only on the extreme areas, and that's why the next little sample over here is an emboss filter. And the emboss filter now is only going to run the emboss on what was left over from that last step. Each one of these is being done in order. And so what was done with the median and then the oil paint is now being embossed. And that's, and I'll take that up just so you can kind of see, I'll exaggerate it. And it's doing again, a little kind of a specular highlight um, to the image. And that is giving us just a little bit of a raised surface to it. So again, we're adding the emboss filter on top of that. The secret sauce that really I think adds a lot, as you'll notice over here, is this, uh, the impression that it's actually interacting with something like a canvas surface. And that is where these, what they call filter galleries, come in. And the first one that we're using here is called Rough Pastel. And the Rough Pastel is actually giving us our little skipping of the brush strokes over the surface texture. So that we've added here. As a default, there is a canvas that's built into Photoshop. It's not a great canvas. You'll notice that over here, if you want, you can actually come up here and load your own texture. And that's why I've given you my own Jack Davis um, texture, right? So in the uh, file here, we'll do the follow along files. And even as part of the ones that you um, can download for free, this is my canvas, which is much more tasteful, much more organic. I really photographed real canvas. So you can use any texture that you'd like in here. In this case, I've given you one, and that's how you load it. But we'll leave it to the one that's built into Photoshop. The last step in this little um, option here is another filter gallery, and that is what they call Texturizer. In Texturizer, I'm also using a canvas texture, and that allows me to kind of exaggerate not only the texture along the edges of the brush strokes, but also in general to um, the, uh, the subtleties, the areas of flat tone. Okay, so you take all of those together and you get from there to here. The nice other thing that's nice about um, smart filters, in this case smart filter recipes, is if you have another um, file that is using uh, a smart object, and let's come over here, so here we've got uh, the one that we've applied to this one. I'm going to come over here and let's find our, okay, this one and our first one. 
So if I've got that smart filter recipe, I can simply come over here and drag and drop whatever I do from one document to another one, and it automatically applies that without needing to do any other jiggery-pokery. So in this case, this now is that photograph with that same recipe. So now you can see it not only done to a portrait, but this, if this was somebody's, your client was their favorite, you know, antique bike, you can now do a painting of it. Okay, and this has that, the same um, parameters of it. This is also in that 16-bit mode. So let's go ahead and image mode, change that to 8-bit, and now it's going to take advantage of those uh, filter galleries that only work in 8-bit. So as soon as we do that, it updates it, and now those have also got their little textures to it. So again, here's our before, after. This is now using a filter to do a painting. The one thing that I'll add here, if I want this logo to be a little bit clearer, each um, smart filter, a set of smart filters, comes with a free, no cost, no obligation layer mask. <laughs> so you can hide or show a portion of whatever effect you're doing. So in this case, if I come over to the good old fashioned paintbrush, have it with black paint, we'll take the size of the brush up, make sure that it's here, change the opacity of the brush to something like 50. Tapping, of course, the number keys allows you to automatically change the opacity if you have a brush tool active. So I can just come over here and just clean that up a little bit. Okay, let's actually do it a little bit less. I'm going to change the opacity of that brush to something like 20%. And I'm, now I'm just getting a little bit more of that logo because they're probably completely enamored with that logo. So I was painting on the mask, allowing more of the original photograph to show through. If we go back to the portrait of my daughter, the same thing probably would be done with the eyes. Okay, so I'm going to come over here, and with that mask active, clicking on it so it's got a little border on it, I can just come up here and bring in a little bit more detail in the eyes so it's not quite so illustrative, and now that's bringing in more detail to the eyes. Okay. So again, before, after. Okay, so that is filter painting in Photoshop, taking advantage of the smart filter recipe. I often will use these, this recipe right here as a starting point for doing the hand painting. The mixer brush, that expressive, the Indian gentleman that you saw, was um, started using this so I can get all the detail in the hair, in the skin, in the lips, kind of um, automate that process, and then I'll come back in with a mixer brush um, action that I'll share with you in a minute. And then I'll do really expressive strokes around the outside. So I can cheat and do all sorts of detail using this filter, but I get the benefit of expressive painting using something like the mixer brush. Okay? Make sense? Nod your head? You out there in television land? Yes. Okay. So let's go back to the uh, bridge. And uh, I was going to do another one. Yes, a little baby. This is another Brook Crystal shot. This already has the, so just to show you that one, that's really cute because a lot of you are probably doing this sort of thing. So we turn on the um, smart filter uh, visibility, and here again is our little filter. So if you do this as a gallery wrap or something like this, it's really adorable. And as I mentioned before, because this is a smart object, this came from Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom, Double-clicking on the thumbnail for it brings you back right into um, Adobe Camera Raw. And in this case, we could turn it into a black and white, change it or whatever. But as an example, I'll just come over here, and I'm going to convert this to grayscale. We'll say OK. When I jump back into Photoshop, it's going to reapply that smart filter recipe, and now we've got a black and white version of the painting. Okay, so there is a little bit more related to that. OK. Now what we're going to do is we are going to do a um, expressive painting, a little bit more expressive painting, using the pattern stamp tool. And for that, I think what we're going to do is we're going to use, we'll use this little painting here, this little uh, photograph here. Actually, no, let's, we're going to start off with um, another, this one right here. Because the first step, and let's actually start off with a little slide to um, give you some steps for most painting techniques in Photoshop. Okay, if you're going to hand paint as opposed to what we just did using uh, something like a filter set, this is a great way to start off. So the first step, or the zero step, why paint? We already talked about that. 
when you can do all sorts of filtering effects, as you just saw. If you're going to be doing, using your own um, hand, then obviously your, each one of your brush strokes is going to be personal to you. What you're painting, even if you use the exact same technique I'm going to share with you, it's going to be different from me because how your kinetic uh, aesthetics work is going to be different from mine, okay? as, as opposed to everybody else that does it. If you do traditional painting, you're going to be amazed at how much your digital paintings look like your analog paintings. I do traditional oils and watercolors, and my digital paintings look identical to my analog paintings because I do it the same way. How I work with it, how I prep the canvas, how I do my brush strokes, how I conceive of a painting is the same. So anyway, so with that, okay, so why paint? All sorts of things you can do that. Step one, enhance, embellish, elaborate, and that would include collage your image. Um, the first thing is to go beyond what was captured. If all you're trying to do is imitate a good photograph, you already got a good photograph, just forget the whole painting thing and be done with it. You have permissions with paintings to get funky. It's one of the nice things about doing paintings, is that you have permission to do stuff that you would never do in a photograph. A lot of my traditional photographs actually look very painterly because I exaggerate color and tone and texture and I, I'm more expressive. My background is in traditional graphic design, so I, I tend toward the little heavy-handed in terms of my photography. But for those of you who are not that way, you have my permission, my blessing, to go crazy. And that includes embellishing. So we're going to start off with that. The next step, we're going to prep brushes and canvas. I've done a lot of that for you in the presets that I'm giving you. But that actually is where a lot of magic comes in. Three is load your photograph into the brush. When we're talking about this um, hand painting of photographs, we're talking about cloning. Okay, again, if you're going to do it from scratch, a blank canvas, and just start painting, God bless you. If you have that talent, if you have that gift, endowed upon you from birth, go for it. Okay? Most of us do not. And so what we're talking about when we paint in Photoshop is how do I clone my photograph? Right? And this is where painting for profit comes in. If you really are painting from scratch, there's no way you're going to profit from it because it's going to take you weeks, years, ages to do it. So what we're talking about now is cheating. The nice thing about loading your photograph that you have enhanced as step one into your brush is you're going to be able to um, allow the computer to do the mixing of your colors for you. That right there is going to save you a huge amount of time. And the fact that you're going to be able to kind of trace your photograph is also going to save your time because you don't need to have any talent. Okay? As, as anathema, as, for those of you who have talent, you go, dude, that is just so wrong to say that you don't need talent to paint. No, that's, there are different times. I do painting from scratch. There are times when you just need to get the work done, the work out, make money from it, and move on. So that's what we're talking about in cloning. How you load your photograph into the brush is dependent upon what you're going to do. The art history is an example. Um, in the, uh, there's actually a PDF that you're going to get as part of your downloads today that'll talk about both the art history and the pattern stamp technique. The art history actually uses what's known as a um, history snapshot in order to load the photograph into the brush. So when you paint with the art history brush, you actually just choose something in the history palette, say, I want you to paint with that, paint, and you can get really cool stuff. What we're going to do now is the pattern stamp. Pattern stamp is completely unintuitive because the only way you'll use the pattern stamp to do painting in Photoshop is to do what's known as defined pattern of your entire photograph. So that's how we're going to load the photograph into the brush. When we do this painting right now, we're going to do a little watercolor, is we're going to do that um, by making a pattern out of our entire photograph. The mixer brush that came in with Photoshop CS5 Cool, groovy, awesome, was meant for smudging a photograph, never meant for really cloning it. In other words, you can take it and just smudge it, really beautiful brush strokes, but you're smudging. The problem with smudging is if you smudge a second stroke, you've smudged the smudge. And that, if you're used to traditional painting, means you're going to get mud real quick. Or you work very slowly with teeny tiny brushes, and you just, and again, you're back to painting weeks to use the mixer brush to do a painting. I've given you an action, which is bitchin', which will automate the process of loading your photograph into your brush. So you can use the mixer brush without sampling all layers. It's faster, it's quicker, it's easier. You'll see that in a second. That's something that we'll probably come back at another Creative Live three-day class and, and do some more extensive stuff on that. We'll just, I'll, I'll tease you with that, but we're going to spend time on the pattern stamp. Step four is what you would do in traditional painting. Block in shapes, darks and lights, what you would normally do with a traditional painting. 
You can refine that, pull back in details. That's where you're going to go into the eyes or the leaves or whatever you're working on. You work from the um, um, exaggerated big areas to the small areas of detail. That's what you traditionally do in a painting. And uh, the six, after you're done, is enhance the tactile effect. Since this is digital, what we're really talking about is fooling the mind, right? The, the term in Hollywood is suspending disbelief. How can you take your painting far enough so that a person actually thinks that they're looking at uh, a painting? Okay, you're messing with people's mind. So for the canvas, that's adding the texture to it, it's adding the patina. When we do a watercolor, that's going to be doing something to add the effect of a wash. When you do a wash in a watercolor, as the, um, the wash dries, as the water dries, the pigments tend to disperse to the edge, and you get this darker kind of edge to your watercolors. So we'll do that as part of this enhancing stage. Okay, so that's texture overlays, patinas, edge exaggerations, density, color tone. Again, you have a computer, take advantage of it, you get to have all sorts of fun. The last one, sharpen for output. A painting, if you look at a real watercolor, if you're doing an output onto watercolor paper, it's going to be razor sharp. There's no softness to it. And um, so sharpening your painting is actually a very important step because, again, it, it kind of ties all the different elements you've brought together and allows you to do that. Okay, so that's sharpening. Um, when we get into enhancing, these are kind of what we're going to do right now with an enhancing. Um, tone and color, you could sharpen or soften. You have blurring. If you didn't know it, you could shorten depth of field inside Lightroom and ACR after the fact. Um, you could do that targeted recolor. That's what we just did with my daughter's painting. So you could use that as a starting point, using those HSL sliders, as I just mentioned. Um, you could do the hand tinting. You could use that as a starting point as well, if you wanted to. Edge framing. I often will add an edge to a uh, photograph, like a white edge. So when I do the painting, um, it bleeds off to nothing. Okay, so you see that, and again, it helps uh, fool the mind because your brush strokes go out to a blank canvas. In this case, we're going to open a smart objects. The nice thing about doing that as part of your process is that you always have the ability to go back to the photograph either in uh, Adobe Camera Raw or in Lightroom okay, so to fine tune it. And again, once you've brought it into Photoshop as part of this enhancing step, you can combine collage or retouch. Okay, in terms of, let's go back. As an example, good uh, friend of mine, let's do, we'll go uh, show our samples again. Uh, this painting right here, okay, my friend uh, <laughs> John Hogburn, great friend, great surfer, not quite this good of a surfer, okay, hanging five right here. So I removed the front of the surfboard to make it look like he was a little bit, had a little bit more prowess than he actually had. In this case, over here, a shot taken over in Morea and Tahiti. There was no canoe in the painting, and so I added that before I started the painting. So again, like I said, you have permission to knock yourself out, get a little funky, and um, have that as part of the process. Here, we'll just do another example. This shot down in Brazil, this is the final watercolor painting of it. So you can see I did a huge exaggeration. This was probably an hour after sunset. So color and tone, clearing junk off the beach, allows me to do this nice little thing. So that's part of this enhancing stage right here. Let's back up, and we're going to use this one right here, and I'm going to go into back into ACR, or Lightroom could be the starting point, and we're going to do our um, little enhancing here. So first off, I'm going to be in the basic panel. We're just going to do little things like, you know, clarity, maybe a little shadow. We'll do a little um, saturation. We'll do uh, a little, let's actually, we'll just say that that's, we'll take that over the top in terms of our saturation. Sometimes when I want to exaggerate things like blues and golds, I actually use saturation instead of vibrance. Vibrance, as you probably know, is intelligent saturation. It's very judicious with oranges, which in this case we want to exaggerate. So um, things like gold fields or sunsets using saturation as opposed to vibrance is often a really nice tip. Okay, so we've got that here. We may do something like our graduated filter and take down exposure. We'll you know, exaggerate that sky if we wanted to. We could, uh, as I mentioned, I often like doing a, a little frame on it so it goes out to white. So I'm actually going to come over here and do a white border. If you didn't notice that you could do a white border, you can actually do white borders. Uh, in ACR and Lightroom. So that little white is just going to give me a little something for the paint to come in. 
So there is my before, after. By the way, if you didn't know that you actually can preview multiple settings in Adobe Camera Raw, just jump over to the snapshots window and then that P key gives you an all on, all off. Okay, that's the only way you get a preview for multiple different features within Adobe Camera Raw. If you're in Lightroom, it's the um, backslash key, not the forward slash, but your preview before and after is your backslash key in Lightroom. Nice little shortcut. Okay, so we're going to open object, as I mentioned. Now we've got our image and we're ready to do a painting. We're going to use that uh, pattern stamp um, feature that I mentioned before. So for that, the first thing I want to do is I want to put this photograph into my brush. And for that, we're going to go Edit, Define Pattern. And again, this is all in that PDF that I've given you as well. Okay? So Define Pattern. And it's going to allow you to name it, say yes, fine, thank you. And now we have that available as an option. If we come over here to our Pattern Stamp tool, over here on the left-hand side, hidden underneath the Clone Stamp, we're going to find our pattern stamp. And now we're going to go up to the options bar. Okay, and the options bar are all the parameters that you can change associated with this. And this is where it has the one little feature, the impressionist setting. And that's where the magic comes in. Like I said, this is not intuitive. This is the pattern, the bubble, okay, the bubble and tie-dye. Those are the only things that Adobe thinks are useful in uh, using the pattern stamp, but again, it's mind-bogglingly useful. Here's our photograph that we just turned into a pattern. That's what we're going to select. And the impressionist setting is going to allow us to use the color from the original, but not the detail. That's going to allow us to get expressive. And rather than just clone back in our photograph, it allows us to do a, what they call impressionist setting. Okay? So those are the settings associated with it. You have also uh, flow and uh, airbrush settings and other parameters, I've given you, as part of those presets that I've um, already talked about loading, when you come over here to the upper left-hand corner, there's a little teeny icon, okay, and there is the only die, there's that tie-dye one that I mentioned before. We should have, I think that I opened, let's go back here to bridge, and we'll go back to our settings and make sure we loaded them. There's our follow along files. Here's our pattern stamp. Ah, it, we've got something set up so it looks like I'm going to actually drag them over the icon for Photoshop to make sure that they load up. Now when I come over here, there's all the presets. So that's another shortcut if you didn't know for any preset in Photoshop you can also drag it over the icon, either the shortcut in Windows or something in the dock, and it forces it to open. In this case, it got confused when I did a command O and it opened it up in text edit. Okay, so in case you don't see them, you can also come over here to the upper right-hand corner of the panel over here, what are known as your tool presets, and you can come up here and load tool presets and just find what you downloaded from me. But these are what I've given you. These different WOW, pattern stamp, chalk, dry brush, oil, and watercolor. All of these you have with my blessing. And we're going to do a watercolor. We're going to start off with large. And that, by clicking on this preset, is going to change all the parameters associated with that brush. Okay? Including, when we come over here, it's going to set the parameters over here in the brushes palette. Including things like texture. And that's where it's going to load in my WOW patterns and textures that I've given you as well. So that's one of the main things that gives a brush its realism, is having real textures built into it. So if you're going to be creating your own brushes, by all means, you're going to be taking advantage of this ability to add in textures. Okay, so that's really what's going on. Also, things like the dual brush mode, that means you can have more than one tip. And the nice thing about that is that these tips are actually going to um, interact with each other. And that gives you a much more organic tip uh, when you're painting. Okay? So that, I've given those, again, knowing the, the uh, lack of time that we had here, uh, I've gone ahead and given you those presets for the brushes, and they're already applied. Okay, so we have our photograph is inside my brush, so to speak. I'm ready now to paint. I could start painting if I wanted to right now. But first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an um, empty layer above this. I can actually throw away this layer if I wanted to. The photograph is up here. I'm not actually using this photograph. Once I've taken, uh, turned it into a pattern, I don't need it, but it's going to help me trace. Okay? So I'm going to go up 
And uh, I'm going to do an advanced tip for you guys, because I like you. And I can already tell that you guys are tracking so well. I could create just an empty layer and fill it with white, and we'll call that paper. But I'm going to actually come over here to where normally you find your adjustments, okay, your levels and curves and everything else. These first three have nothing to do with adjustments. They're called fill layers. And one is called pattern. And since I've given you a bunch of patterns, you're going to find patterns, like in this case, a canvas texture. Okay? And we'll actually do this as a large list so you can read these. So I'm going to come up. We're not going to use gray granite. We're going to come up. Eh, this is the canvas texture that we can use later. Um, let's actually, for simple, let's actually, I'm going to save this one for later. Let's actually do what, what normally most people would do, is just create an empty layer, fill it with our background or foreground color. In this case, we'll fill it with our background color, white. We'll change our opacity a little bit. I think this is even in the PDF. So basically, it's going to allow us to give us our paper that we're going to be uh, painting on top of. And our photograph is below, so we can kind of use it to trace. I could paint on this layer right now, but actually what I want to do is paint right above my paper, which is very difficult to do in the real world. If you've ever tried painting an eighth of an inch above the actual canvas, <laughs> it's, that takes some serious Jedi skills to do that. But in this case, let's call this paper. Okay, and we're going to create another layer right above it, and we're going to call this paint. And this is what we're actually going to paint on. Okay, so it's going to allow us to keep the, the paper and the paint separate. And I've got my watercolor. I've chosen my watercolor large. I've got the photograph loaded into it, and now I'm ready to paint. I'm going to paint the exact same way I would paint a traditional watercolor. In this case, I'm going to do one large wash for the sky. If you pick up your brush when you're doing a wash, it's going to start drying. And then when you do another brush stroke, you're going to be working on pigment on top of pigment. And you can actually see that edge sometimes. So oftentimes, when you're laying down a background wash, you want to do that in one fell swoop. It's one continuous block of water that's wet the paper. And so I'm going to do that for the entire sky. And I'm going to stop when I get to the clouds. And so I'm going to start painting. And you'll notice the nice thing about the um, brush, if I, if I stop, you'll notice that it's actually flooding the paper with the pigment. Okay? So it continues to paint as you do it. So that is, again, the technical term is bitchin'. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to do, I'm not going to lift my Wacom, my little stylus coming from my Wacom. And I'm going to come over here. And if I come over to the edge, you're going to notice that it actually goes white, because right? that's the source is white. So I actually get this nice little fade out as it comes up to my edge. I often leave little teeny gaps in my paintings, okay, as if you're working real fast, as if this was a little you know, sketch, watercolor sketch, sketch that you're doing in the field. So I'm going to leave a little gaps on purpose. And there's my sky. If I turn that off, it's a nice translucent. If I make the opacity of that paper um, 100%, okay, you can see what the, that little um, wash did for me. Okay, and I'll take that opacity of just that paper texture down. I can now continue to trace back on there. And now I'm going to do kind of the clouds. And just like I would do in traditional watercolor, I would not let my colors touch. Okay? Because if they do, they're going, to, they're going to bleed. If I come down here, you'll notice that the field, the gold, is bleeding into my sky. So I'm not. I'm going to undo that. And I'm going to make sure that my washes okay, do not touch. So now I'm going to do a wash for that field. I'm going to not do the shadows. Okay, and I can come over here, and I can actually go off the page, as I mentioned before. Okay. I've created, because these are what are known as analog brush tips, they are actually um, captured brush tips, um, I created different sizes for each one. So we can go to a medium to pull in more detail. So we're going to do this here. I can let them overlap. I am going to do some overlapping here. Okay, I think if I turn this off here, I can see kind of a little fence post. 
So as I come over here and do another one, you're going to notice that it's getting a little bit darker. Okay, so I can, just by doing a second hit, I can start doing darker portions of it. Okay, same thing with the clouds. We're not going to do too much in here. Just because of our time, we want to do one more. So that is our quick little washes that we've done, that we've done so far. I could come up and uh, do other little augments to it. Oftentimes, a nice thing with watercolor is to do a little like pastel on top of it, come in back with a hard, either uh, uh, a, um, a pastel uh, pencil and do little details. So we could even do a, another little layer on top of this one and choose a different one. So we're going to come up here and we'll do a little chalk small. We'll do chalk extra small. And that also is going to use that same pattern that I have um, set up. So I can come over here and let's make that paper so I can actually see it. So now I can come up here and I'm actually doing little teeny details as if I was painting a little chalk on top of this. So I'm just going around parameters, the, the base of the tree, okay, maybe the, the shadow, I could do little portions of it. I could come over here and do the posts on the fence here, small little details. Now I've turned on the watercolor, turned off so I could kind of see the photograph below. And then again, that shows you the benefit of working on the computer because you can cheat. Very difficult to turn off portions of an image if you do that. So again, there is my little, um, little pastel on top of it to pull in some detail. We'll call that good enough for government work now. Actually, we're going to do one other thing. Go back to uh, my watercolor, and we'll do small. And now I'm going to paint on that edge. You can't really erase. I see that, five minutes. Um, you can't really erase in watercolor. You can blot, if you've ever done that. That's called taking a paper towel. And I'm basically blotting up the edge now by painting white on that edge, right? Because the, my original that I grabbed had that white edge that I did in ACR. So now you can notice that I'm able to actually blot the edge and give me my nice little, almost a deckled edge in the watercolor painting, okay? The last thing, because this is so translucent, my brushes are so translucent, for watercolor, um, I want to add density to it. Rather than paint multiple layers on it, the nice thing in Photoshop, of course, is you can duplicate any layer. So if you just simply drag it down to the new layer icon or do a Command or Control J, I've just doubled the density of the painting. Okay? So that is another nice little thing that you can do there. I don't need to double the you know, intensity of this. I can actually change the opacity of this one down if I want to make that more subtle. You get the basic idea. Okay, so here is our original and our quick, quick little painting. I'm going to jump to the enhancing stage. I mentioned before adding textures and different patinas to it. For those, again, I've given you actions to automate the process because I knew I only had an hour with you guys. So I'm going to go to the actions palette, back to the ones I've already given you, okay, and paint enhance subtle, paint edge enhance subtle. And this is going to be that pooling of the pigments along the edge of any area of contrast. So I'm going to run that action. All my actions. And what that did is it made this little action that you, you'll notice. If you look up here in our upper left-hand corner, you can see that the pigments are now pooling, so to speak, around that edge. Okay? So that is a little edge enhanced. That's the subtle one. The last one that I'll do for adding another little patina, as it were, to it is I'm going to use one of those uh, pattern fill layers. And again, this is all in that PDF. That's part of being here today. I'm going to use that pattern fill adjustment down here. And I'm going to go and I'm going to use one that I like. And where is, I'm hoping, you know what? I've got my canvas one here. We'll use, we'll use canvas. I was going to use my salt stain overlay, but we'll use the canvas one. Um, we'll use the canvas. You'll notice I've done, you've got things like, these are gesso patterns that you can use over a painting. When we do oil, this is a, a great step in here. But we'll go ahead and uh, use just our canvas one. Because what I want to show you 
is, as you probably know, blend modes in Photoshop are organized based upon what they do. Specifically, they're based upon what color is neutral that they work with. The ones that start with the word darken can only darken. The ones that start with the word lighten can only lighten. Whatever's on that layer can only lighten what's below it. They can't darken it. These that start with the word overlay or soft light are known as the dodge and burn or contrast blend modes. They can both lighten and darken. So if I turn this over to soft light, you'll notice that I'm able to add this patina, okay, this canvas texture on top of my painting without changing the tone. And I'll reduce that opacity there. Okay. So those are the enhancing stage. The last thing that you can do is do some sharpening if you'd like. Um, so that is one of the options that you can do there. Let's actually, I'm going to go ahead and just run the action for using the mixer brush because that's where it gets really fun. Consider this a tease for you to come back to Creative Live when I do my entire painting class. Okay. If some of you have uh, actually have a painting title um, that uh, is coming out, if you've pre-ordered that, that's still coming. It's not out right now. I'm probably getting questions in the uh, online chat that's coming. But anyway, so I'm going to take this and I'm going to go image and I'm going to duplicate this layer. This is a great way. If you use save as, this is a great way of doing that. And I'm going to run this action that I'm going to give to you all in real quick. And it's called Davis Mixer Painting Setup, okay, down here. And you're going to run it. And it's going to run you through this process. And you'll notice that it's actually automatically adding the white edge. It's adding vibrance. It's doing everything else. It's choosing the brush for you. It's walking your cat, washing your windows, brushing your teeth. It adds the patina, it adds all the layers, it does everything that you could possibly imagine for you. And basically, and it in, has set it up, and I'll just do it for you now. It's got, it's named all the layers for you. Here's the rough underpainting. It's got the brushes for you. And when you paint, this is actually using the um, photograph. But the secret is that I won't tell you now, because this will bring you back, You'll notice up here what normally you have to have with a mixer brush is sample all layers because you're smudging something. You'll notice I don't have sample all layers turned on and yet I'm still able to, and I can paint that white in here, okay, or paint out. I'm still able to um, get the colors from my photograph. And the great thing about not being reliant on using sample all layers is it's very fast. The, um, responsiveness of this brush is fantastic if you don't have to sample because that's it the smudging okay so we'll come up here and we'll just do this here what you do with this um, action once you run it is you basically work your way up the layers palette so it refine shapes you come up here and now you're going to come up here and continue to refine it and put in more detail and this is going back to the original photograph okay you're not smudging a smudge because you're going back to the original photograph you can paint in details, and again, each one of these, you can make the brush smaller. The nice thing about this is using the mixer brush. It's a, it's a um, procedural brush, so you can scale it. They're not actually bitmaps. They're actually imitating. You can see this brush up here, the simulation up here, and as it rotates. And uh, so it's simulating real bristles. So you can scale the brush using those square bracket keys, and they work great. And you come up here in Final Highlights. This actually, I've got it, so it actually does a lighter version of your original image, which is again what you would do in the real world. You'd come up here and you would lighten portions of the image. As you work up the layers palette, you've got final shadow, so this is gonna be darker than your original image, which is really cool, what you do in traditional. The last step in terms of the painting is a blending mode. And for that, there's three brushes that I'm giving you. The um, oil brush, um, oil detail, and oil blender. So using this blender is where you're gonna come up here and let's zoom up. You're going to have the ability to blend your different brush strokes together. Okay, and that really is the final desist de resistance here because it allows you to unify all your different uh, brush strokes together. Okay, let's jump over to the bridge. I'll show you a uh, final painting, the one that was originally for. This one here, and we'll turn on. This is running the action, the same action that you were just looking at. And let's come up here, and here is our final 
painting. I'm using just what we were looking at. Okay. And this includes, so this is using that mixer brush. Here's the rough underpainting, refining the strokes. We're going to come up here. So here's that original painting we were just doing, refining the strokes, putting in some more details. Here are highlights. Here are shadows. Okay, there is that final blending. And then here are the, let's go back down, we'll turn on our base. And uh, the impasto, that's running that action. There's another one of the actions in the, the enhance. Here is adding the gesso brush strokes after the fact. I've also given you this texture. And here's doing a final little color and tone on here. Okay? So here is mixer brush painting in Photoshop CS6. And uh, it also works in Photoshop CS5, but it is even cooler in CS6. That new oil paint filter that we started off the day in is only available in Photoshop CS6. And now it's time for questions. So there we go. Nice. That's all I could do in an hour. <laughs> what questions do you have? Wow. Yes. That was amazing. I just want to start off by saying that I had uh, two quick questions. Once, uh, how are you printing these, considering you're already putting a canvas texture on? That's a very good question. Um, one, I've set up my uh, textures, since they're scans of original, of real textures. I output them at 225 uh, PPI for output, either to canvas, if it's kind of an oil painting technique, then I'll do like a gallery wrap. And your, the textures on your painting will match the textures on the canvas at 225 uh, PPI. It was designed for that, which is plenty of resolution for a gallery wrap. If you're doing a watercolor technique, um, then printing it out on a watercolor paper, again, you don't have to exaggerate the texture because that'll be built into it. So those are the two stocks that I use, either watercolor paper, if that's the technique, or I'll do a gallery wrap. And uh, the one tip is the 225. Okay, sorry, and just one more real quick. Um, is there a way when you're painting a stroke to, um, I know the embossing makes it come out almost as you're using a thickening agent with a paint. So is there a way to make it kind of fade into that embossing? You know, like maybe you want your, in an abstract, you want the end of the stroke to be more appearance. Well, you'll notice here, if we're looking at, at this right here, that I'm getting that thickness. And that is actually, I'm doing after the fact. You can see that right there. I mean, how that exaggerated what's known as an impasto. Okay, when you're working wet on wet, if you're doing a, a plein air out in the field, you have to work wet on wet, which means you're using thick paint so they don't interact. You actually have to use this, this impasto technique. So they are thick. That's a real good portion of the technique. Some people actually turn on an embossing layer style as they do. The problem with that is it uses the transparency between strokes to do the embossing which isn't really, because then if you don't have any transparency, there's no embossing. So I don't use that. It's cool. So this um, action that you're running that here, and this is what it looks like, okay? So that's what is actually doing it. And it's using that same, remember those blend modes? This is overlay or soft light. So that's why I can use this and get the, um, the texture. So it doesn't give you the subtleties where you can say, well, there's no embossing at the light end and there's heavy embossing at the other end. There's really no way to do that. You can't actually put it into the brush itself. You have to either do it with a layer style or you do it with something like this action. But it actually does you know, a, really, a pretty good job. But there's a very good question. Wish you could, but you can't. Can, you, can non tablet work on this? You can do that. It's a very good question. You don't need a tablet. But the, the painting, as they say, with a mouse is kind of like painting with a bar of soap. You don't get the gestural feel to it. So even um, Wacom has got the bamboo styluses, which are under 100 bucks. Even if you had one of those, that's better than nothing. Uh, technically, if you had a, a, even the little trackpad, you, know, you could use, there's some styluses that are made to work on a laptop trackpad. But this is the game changer because this allows your body to get into it. And that really, one of the things, I'll be working in Photoshop you know, 12 hours a day. And when I'm done, I'll do a painting. Still in Photoshop, when I should be out getting a life. But that's because painting, even this digital painting, is cathartic. And part of that, that process, why it's so exciting, is the fact that your body's getting into it. It's really the only time. So I would save up, do any way you can, whether it's a bamboo or the Intuos, get whatever you can um, to, to get it. Because that gesture really is what's going to make your personal. You can see at these gestures how expressive these are. 
my gestures are going to be different from yours. So you can. Those first techniques we did with the hand tinting certainly would work fine. Um, so, yes. Others, yes. When you were antiquing, there was the option that you had turned on and off for uh, mask and auto mask. What's the main difference between the two? Auto masking within Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw is going to look for an edge. And so while I, with our, while I was doing that soft edge transitions of the different colored areas, if I had turned that or left that on, it was actually on as a default, it would have found a hard edge and started or stopped the mask at that point, which is really nice if I wanted to do, say, a coloring technique where I've turn the entire image into black and white, and let's say you've got the traditional bouquet that the bride's holding, I could you know, erase the, the desaturation for the bouquet and it would be a razor sharp edge. With the painting techniques, I don't want that. Actually, I love the interaction of the colors um, on that. So I, I purposely don't have the auto mask turned on. The auto mask feature actually does a great job um, and it's great, but again, here's another landscape and here is the painting afterward. And you can see the softness throughout. I'd let the palm fronds go into the sky and it just, it looks more realistic.